Hey everyone, Joshua Hamlin here at Brick Rodeo in Austin, and today we're back with the Peterson Brothers, and they've brought a fantastic new layout here. It's all space-themed, so if you guys want to introduce yourselves, then we'll take a look at this. Yeah, so I'm Trent. I'm Landon. I'm, a I'm Andrew. Okay. And what do we have here today? So this is our very first showing of what we call distant world exploration. We have a alien planet where people have colonized, and they have a whole operation here and we'll take you through it uh, starting with the base here on the far end. So. so we're gonna send the monorail down into the mountain because that's where they're mining so the flip of the switch on its way. Everybody loves a good monorail. They're notoriously finicky but we're having okay success right now. Um, so we're gonna start by working inside the base here. So we have this really cool kind of research lab facility going on. You notice on top we have a telescope uh, we, we used to all work in the astronomy department, and so that's kind of our nod there. And so as we start taking off some of these layers, we're going to get to see some of the innards. You see those big trans blue pieces used for the windows there? Yes, yeah, so that was Andrew's design. He spent some time working with all the geometry there, which I understand was not trivial, um, but he managed to make it work. we got a little solar panel farm here. Being that it is a desert planet, there's lots of sun. So if we look inside here, and let's go ahead and pull this out so you guys can see, we have a little waiting room at the front with kind of a little vending machine. Looks like it's not working too well. And then we have like the, the geology department, so all the different minerals that they're finding and mining they can research there. And we also have a little biology department that they're kind of uh, discovering the life that might be on this planet, you know, just kind of research facility type stuff. And you'll note a small landing pad on the top with bulkhead doors to get in that way. I love all the little details in there, and each room kind of has its own use. This is just a corridor. It kind of looks like an old spaceship, as if it would sit this way, and it, and it was. It was actually part of the first landing craft here, and they reused it as their first base, and so from there they expanded everywhere. So it kind of has a, oh yeah, it does open up, of course. It's got some like space gear so they can go outside in the harsh environment. I'm not sure if there is an atmosphere on here that's breathable, but it, they all have their oxygen tanks on, so they're set. <laughs> Um, next layer just has kind of a control room, living quarters. Notice the cool little slanty glass thing so they can look down into the main uh, research facilities. There's kind of spots for them to hang out. It's got to get very boring being able to have to live in the same place all the time. So I love the staircase design there as well. Yeah, that was also Andrew. Um, it, it's holding up well. It's pretty cool. It kind of gets facaded there in the window and just nice little detail. Good for the curvature design on the walls, which makes it more unique as well. And we're going to leave this one in place for the moment, but we got a cool like reactor here, and that's the mineral that they're mining, and so they're using it for power, and we've got what I like to call a little soda fountain, but you know, the different minerals inside of there that they're researching. There's a machine shop here, some other kind of processing uh, equipment and different, you know, just kind of spacey looking things. There's research going on here. What's some of the variety of minifigs you've got in there? All of it, lots of different colors of classic space? Yeah, so we have all the, uh, the, all the colors of the classic space, um, a lot of the Futron guys as well. We're not really uh, locked down to a particular type, but we just like all those old colorful, you know, just uh, space figures going around. And then you notice here we have ourselves a, a dock for the, I guess, a station for the monorail. So we've got a cool crane. They can actually pick up the supply crates that everything's loaded into, and they can also whenever a ship lands, we can actually crane them onto that ship and get them off world. So, and the, the lore of this whole kind of planet is that the sand and the terrain is very harsh and the environment's bad and they don't have a very high level of technology. So they don't have like hovercrafts and cool things like they would in Star Wars per se. So they have to rely on monorails to get past the toxic river and the, you know, the harsh kind of impassable terrain to get it out so they can get it off world. So I'll hand you over to Landon and he'll tell you some more about what's going on on top here. Okay, so as we move across, you see we have this kind of a greenhouse type thing where there's some earth plants and it's kind of contained in its own little atmosphere so they can grow some, some of their own food maybe. Um, we have this huge sand dune that kind of cuts this in half, um, which the monorail track was there, was used to cross that, and we also have this little minifigure path to get across. One thing I love about the sand dune here is that there's kind of a variation in height, so it's not just one you know static wall the whole time. Yes, there's a, a slight height variation and also a slight uh, position variation here where it's kind of a jumper so we get that half stud gradient as we go across. Um, 
So here we have kind of a little oasis area in the desert. It's got kind of alien grass and plants, and they're studying here. Um, so we like to pick colors that were not really Earth-like, so it's very clear it's, uh, it's an alien world here. Um, so, so across the Toxic River here, we have this gigantic mountain, and uh, we'll just open it up and show you what's inside. Okay, so you can see right now you've got the big panels on the back here, but of course, everything with you guys has an interior. There's, it's always very modular, so this, this section here might, might be my favorite part of the whole build. Yeah, that's our hidden unicorn department. There's nothing going on there. That's fully for if we have a problem with the monorail and get stuck, we can get into it. Okay. But we are also notorious for annexing any free space, so maybe next year there's going to be something going on in there. Who knows? There's always more creatures you can add in. That's correct. So you see this is where the monorail ended up. They're, they're kind of a staging area inside the mountain, and they got a little un unloading area, a crane to move all their cargo onto this uh, giant lift here. And this actually can take them all the way down to the underground here, seeing as it's moving. That's sweet. So you got, it's actually playable, it actually moves, and so the whole process from, you know, mining to the station all works. Yeah, there's a way for them to get people and equipment and cargo all the way from you know, the base and their landing pad all the way down underground, which will now begin to reveal, so. It's always funny to see a build being dismantled as you go through it, but it's great to see inside here. <laughs> Start to see some of the rooms open up on the bottom. There's intentional dismantling here, right? It's not accidental disassembly, right? So we have these cool facade bits here that kind of hide what's going on, and as we start to take them off, there's a really nice perspective so where like uh, smaller kids can look into, and it's just fun to look into the caves that way. So I'll let you get a look at that while I set these down over here. Um, so right here you can see a glimpse of the human uh, base area. They're, you can see the base in the background. They're unloading some cargo. Um, if you move down further here, you can see where their mining operation starts, starting to, to drill up this orange mineral and get that all working. So I love how you kind of created this like forced perspective almost view here before you take off the top sections, kind of just a taste of what's under here. Yeah, well, that's something we wanted where you could see the top and some of the bottom at the same time. Uh, it's kind of an advantage over the castle where it was kind of like a all-off or all-on thing. Here you can get, get an idea of both and see how it all lines up. So um, let's uh, look back here right under the mountain. So here you have the lift where it came down. Uh, they're unloading some equipment. Um, Looking back here, you can see a glimpse of the human base. Some of the rooms, there's like a little garage where they're unloading stuff. There's a little machine shop and some corridors you can see down there. So uh, let's take off the mountain and get a broader view of this. It's crazy how modular this is. You guys are able to just like pick up these massive sections and reveal everything. Yeah, well, that's all practice from the, the castle's design, and we've, we've made a lot of improvements on that, so it, it's even more streamlined. So we're going to take off a chunk of it here and give you all an idea of what's under here. Here's sort of the underground base where they have a little bit of refuge. Um, it's, they've got a nice little kitchen and an armory, some more, more sleeping areas. We have toilets now. The castle does not have toilets. This has toilets, so little purple space guy on the toilet, little medical bay, because I'm there's bound to be some accidents down here. Very dangerous work. You know, it's kind of that corporate, you know, put the guys out there and do the hard work. And well, if it happens, it happens. So little computer rooms. We got ourselves a, a little sliding doors, you know, double airlocks. Um, we have ourselves a little forklift here that can pull boxes off. And this is kind of like our mechanical handling area so they can, you know, water, air, all those type of things that need to survive. Um, but as you start to see, you know, we've got areas for work and construction and we got a little nod here to one of the old classic um, little rovers here that came in a box they're assembling it just like kind of the World War II jeeps right that's shipped them in a crate that's, that's what's going there and so throughout the build you can kind of see little vehicles that are doing some of the mining we didn't want large mining vehicles we wanted small ones because they got to get down here you know so it's kind of all done over time and a small manpower type stuff 
Yeah, I want to point out this kind of armory room back here, maybe a taste of some more of what we're going to see later on. Yeah, uh, as you see, we'll kind of get a little further into our underground. They start to discover some of the life that lives on this planet. So I can see here we've got some of what we call wall crawlers that have started to kind of burrow their way through, and they've kind of popped out, and there's some soldiers kind of dealing with them. They're not the most violent or scary things, but, you know, in large numbers, they're going to be a problem, right? That's probably like the size of a dog for a minifigure. That's going to be pretty terrifying. <laughs> So we're going to take off some more segments here. And while, while they're doing that, you may explain a little bit more about kind of the modular system here and how those segments fit together. Yeah, so we've got a nice um, kind of plated system under these segments, and we've got these kind of key pieces that help line things in and drop into place. So stuff really just kind of stays where it's supposed to. It's much more seamless, and it just works well. So you build in those little kind of indents, and then it just locks right in with those pyramid pieces. Correct. And you can kind of be off by almost an entire stud, plus or minus, and as long as it gets nearby, it's going to locate and drop right into place, which is very convenient. Mm -hmm. So as you get further along, you know, we've got more vehicles, more mining. You can tell that the human side of caves are nice and open, they're well lit, and as you get a little further, things are going to start to get a little more narrow. And this is our, what we like to call the infinite stone room. We have, they hit a pocket in mining. It has all these crazy gems of different colors. And they're going, holy cow, this is amazing. We've got to mine all this and figure out what it is. Let's go ahead and take off the next ones. That room there really highlights the lights so well with kind of the, using all those different colors of pieces. Yeah, so there's, there's also, like I said, there's lights running throughout this. So that was a, also a challenge. As you can see, they've kind of broken through this area, and they're kind of engaged in some combat here. One bug might have his head popped by um, a soldier, and they're, they're kind of getting kind of... Things are starting to heat up a little bit. It looks so peaceful on top, but underneath the surface, it's yeah. a little different. Under the surface, there's um, things going on. All right. So as we get closer and closer to here, you notice that they're very narrow caves now. They're starting to be more like a creature made them. And so there's guys exploring that, and I would definitely not want to be those guys in there in these dark caves back to back, waiting for something to come out and pop out and get me. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Landon for this one. Okay. Okay, so these tunnels are getting narrower, and they're kind of less explored. We have a couple of soldiers walking around here, kind of tightly packed. Um, you see there's a ton more bugs, they're all crawling around, there's a great shot here, you can see kind of a dual layered setup we have where, you know, they, they kind of expand in any direction in any way here. Um, so, it's getting a little more more interesting, um, so we're going to move this. Let's get this one. So, looking down here in this view, you can kind of get an idea of what, you know, lies at the end here. It's very creepy looking, the green lighting, there's a whole swarm of bugs. Um, so now we'll take off this entire top part and you'll see what what's waiting for the humans down. Whoa! It's not, it's not looking good for the humans in this section. <laughs> yeah, so this whole open area is it's like the hive and we've got just swarms of bugs. you got these smaller ones, medium ones, and this uh, large, the queen bug back here. Um, you can see he's laying a bunch of eggs, and all these workers are hoisting them up and have these sacks hanging from the walls. And the, the idea here is that there's so much of this orange mineral back here that they're, you know, the humans are detecting, and so they're wanting to keep digging back to get to that, not realizing they're digging right into the, the main hive of these bugs. So the situation's about to get real bad for them, but they just don't realize what they're getting themselves into. I love how it's kind of like right on the precipice of breaking open here. So you've got some of the, the human scout soldiers kind of finding out what's going on, but they haven't quite unveiled the the whole uh, breadth of what's, go what's happening. Yeah, we wanted the idea to be this is just before things get really bad. It's kind of, you know, minutes away from being disastrous. So it's kind of the, the scene we wanted to set. And I just want to point out a few more things here. You notice that this is kind of a cave-in, and at some point, these creatures might have had a tunnel to the surface, which is right below the base, but it caved in for whatever reason. And they also don't do very well on the surface. If you notice, there's a couple uh, crispy bugs that scientists are looking going, what, what is this thing? You know, what's going on? The sun kind of dries them out, so they, they prefer to be underground. 
So who knows in their evolution, maybe they were top dwellers at some point and, and they just decided to stay down here. But also something really neat that Landon came in up with, we got these kind of medium-sized bugs here, kind of your soldier type deals. They actually will take nutrients from the, the river here and they'll put them in these little pods here. And that's actually what the little bugs will use to drink later on, that's kind of the, the food making process. So if you look around, there's little spots like here that have a little a collection of them. They've opened up one and they're kind of eating the nutrients and there's a couple other locations that have that. So that's kind of like their bio, right? They just, what they, how they survive, right? So there's lots of little cool details like that going on. Yeah. No, it's, it's super impressive here. So there's so much happening both below ground and above ground with this build. When you first had this planned out, so you referenced a couple times your modular castle layout, uh, which is uh, a really great layout as well. But uh, when you first started with like this build, where did you start kind of planning from and figuring out how it was going to come together? So we actually started with the top side, right? And we kind of got our dimensions and, and got all the topography figured out, knowing fully well that we're going to do an underground section okay. for it. Um, and like you said, we learned a lot of concepts on how to make things a little more removable, a little more modular. Um, our our mock is a little more narrow, which is, makes it easier for us to get into the middle. The castle's like twice as wide, and it's very hard to get in the middle. So we've taken a lot of lessons from that. Also, the mountain was not supposed to be this big, but it be, just kind of became that big. We wanted a big mountain. You know, the castle has a hill, even though it's a pretty good-sized mountain, but we wanted a mountain that you, yeah. just looks like it's on another planet. It's unconquerable. This just big behemoth that would make sense to have a train running through it, right? No, it looks fantastic, both the top section and the bottom section. But if you can point out some more of the, the details kind of in the caves here, uh, what all were you able to include in terms of like different parts and then talk about the lighting as well because okay. there's so much of that throughout. Sure. Um, so kind of one little side note, you can kind of see like the evolution of the bugs. So there's actually little tadpoles in the, the lake there. That's where they start out with. And actually, sorry, there's ones being born here <laughs> from the, that kind of egg collection. And then they grow to the little smaller bugs, and then some of them might turn into the big bugs, but there's only one queen. Um, and if you also can go around the back, you can see she's actually producing eggs too, that the little ones are taking away to kind of store and hang up and incubate or whatever it is that they do, right? I, I'm not the biologist, so. We're still learning about these creatures. Exactly. They're just kind of, you know, showing themselves. We have one guy over here that kind of got lost, I guess, and he definitely did not make it. Um, he was a snack for somebody. Um, but yeah, the, and then I guess we can talk about some lighting. Yeah. So this whole thing is on one big grid of lights, and it's controlled in the back by a USB hub with a bunch of little buttons. So we can actually kind of turn things on and off in sections so that not everything is just totally daisy-chained. Not that we're worried about too much current here, but we can kind of try to isolate if there's a problem. We can know where it is. Mm -hmm. And then since all these sections are modular, they all kind of break apart, we have what I like to call like electrical boxes that that run along the top so we can make our joints and the connections so that we have continuity. And so that's kind of like we just have to remember where those are, make sure everything gets plugged into place, and it works pretty smoothly. Behind a lot of these walls, there's a lot of wires and things that are hidden, and we always hope that we don't snap a wire because that's going to be very painful. I think adding lighting to it really helped. And especially when they did kind of the lights out portion, this thing looked fantastic at, with the lights off Yeah, in, now, in the room. Yeah. Now, with a build like this, with all of the, the sections on top, that's an immense amount of weight. So structurally, what did you have to do to make sure that everything was going to be held up and the mountain wasn't crumbling or something? <laughs> it's just solid. I mean, just the way we build things is completely solid. We do what we call like a, a plate technic sandwich under these panels here so we kind of have like a grid of a bunch of technic beams that are kind of interlaced and you kind of put a sandwich of plates on top of that and they're just rock solid you can pick up any of those land segments by a corner and hold it out candy liver and it's just going to stay there okay. so we have a lot of confidence in how things are going to go um, that's just uh, something that we've designed over time too um, just build it strong to be able to survive transport to a convention right <laughs> that's that's the idea and then for the cave system here, did that just kind of come together, you know, organically, naturally, as you built more? Did you map out, okay, we want like this tunnel here and this tunnel here? Well, it's kind of a combination. We we started laying down a bunch of parts just to get an idea of pads. But as we built and, you know, adding all the detailed layers on top, the walls become so thick. And we realized, you know, maybe we're running out of room. So at a certain point, we transitioned to these kind of thinner, narrower walls to 
get a more you know different style for the bugs they're more windy and smaller but it's kind of a combination of planning and just as you build it just kind of takes the shape that it naturally does and you end up with this so and you see on on this kind of green pond as well as the river that was up top uh some great kind of snot, snot studs not on top type building right so is that the effect you were going for there yeah so all the the green water we have around are just sideways bricks and making this design here um, on the top where it it's kind of hard to tell it's uh, not level but the way it splits four ways here to keep the pattern consistent going across all the removable parts was really tricky to design but when it comes together yeah it's pretty seamless and it looks like a nice constant kind of watery pattern throughout there you guys have an immense quantity of parts, especially of like tan and gray for all of the rock work here. Did, was that, did you have to order a lot of those? How much of that did you have on hand? Most of that was ordered. Uh, some of it we had on hand, but it was a lot of time beforehand just accumulating parts. And then as we built, you know, the, the parts that ran out, we order more. But yeah, uh, it's definitely lots and lots of gray and tan is the main, <laughs> uh, main colors here. Yeah. Do you have any idea how many parts are in the whole layout? I I would guess maybe like about 100,000 or so. We, we haven't weighed it, but it's very dense, and there's a lot of pieces. I know just alone there's 5,000 2 by 4 bricks, and there's at least 10,000 one by 2 slopes just around. So there's a lot of pieces. Yeah, and you've got a ton of minifigures as well. Do you know how many of those are here? What would you say, Landon? Maybe like 100 or so, maybe 125, something like that? Yeah. And bugs, lots of, we made way too many bugs. I have a bag of them still. So we can overrun this place when we want to as well and show that the humans are in big trouble. How did you decide on which, there, which kind of space faction to go with? Because there's been so many great space themes from LEGO over the years. Did you have to kind of debate, well, which one might work the best and look the best with the build? Well, Landon, you've always enjoyed Futron, right? You've always kind of liked that style. So that's kind of what we went with. I just like all the, the variety of colors you get with the classic space and Futron. And we didn't design it specifically as like a Futron theme, just it's kind of our thing with those minifigures added and kind of our unique uh, kind of marine design. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to ask about the, those kind of marine type figures. Where did you get some of the parts from that, the armor and that sort of thing? So the armor is from a, a classic, or no, a collectible minifigure. And it's just that black armor piece on all of them. And underneath, I think it's just a Rock Raider shirt. So kind of our own <laughs> unique uh, space soldier design. Yeah. So. Well, it's, that's very nice. So this whole layout is just fantastic here. Uh, do you have plans? I know with the castle, you've continued to expand on it over the years. Are there any similar plans for this to maybe do more with it? Yeah, there, there's some plans. We, we're going to keep them secret for now. But we have some <laughs> ideas. We, we, we have some ideas. Okay. There, we would be lying to you if we didn't. So. <laughs> yes. I love a good teaser. You know, you yeah. gotta you gotta come back to Brick Rodeo next year and see what happens. Exactly, exactly. Unfortunately, we kind of that's what people are expecting now. So it's like, oh no, it's gotta be bigger and better. And low. what have we created, right? But awesome. And I should mention that there's a very great public element to this as well. So you've taken apart the whole build for us right now, but you also do this like while the public is here at the show. So talk a little bit about kind of how that works and how you guys interact with the public. Yeah. So a couple times a day during the, when there's public here. We will kind of hint at what's going on in the underground. Maybe we'll take off a section or two, and people can look into there, and the kids are always like, wow. We'll say, but hey, you know, shortly we're going to take the whole top layer off, and the people are just blown away because they don't expect something like that to be inside there. So then they have lots of questions. It's a lot of fun. You know, I, I feel like the public likes to watch us lift big pieces and hope we don't drop them and, and whatnot, so that always, always blows people's mind. <laughs> uh, part of the performance of it all, I guess. I don't know. Uh, it's a whole experience yeah. over here you put on. <laughs> right, right. It's an immersive experience, yeah. So. No, I love it. Well, great work, guys. Thank you, uh, all three of you, for, for your work here at the show and then all the work building this, obviously, as well. It's fantastic to see the displays that you guys put together. So keep it up and looking forward to more. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for recording this and hope people can enjoy it, maybe get some inspiration.